Hey, what's happening? I just wanted to let you know that you forgot to put one of our new cover sheets on your TPS report. And also, I'm going to need you to come in tomorrow. Um, if you could be there by about 8 o'clock, that'd be great. Okay? Bye-bye. Industrial organizational psychology focuses on studying people at work and in organizations. Uh, the industrial part is, you know, focusing on and identifying those kinds of job skills that are important for various positions and to select people and train them to fill those positions. The organizational part of industrial organizational psychology is focused on creating structures, creating company cultures that will help to improve overall efficiency and worker morale. I have a video down in the links uh, just introducing what IO psychology is all about and really expressing the fact that it is an extremely high demand kind of psychology. People need IO psychologists. Now, when it comes to the research in IO psychology, there's been a lot of interesting uh, findings. For example, we've identified two different kinds of efficiency. You have work efficiency. This is what we traditionally think of as efficiency. That's just getting the maximum amount of output at the minimum cost. And that's, of course, very important. But another kind of efficiency, which is just as important, if not more so, is psychological efficiency. So that's the maintenance of good morale in the workplace, labor relations, uh, employee satisfaction, and similar kinds of aspects. So, of course, you want to make a good profit, but you also want to have uh, a good, you know, organizational culture. That way, it'll make it easier to grow and be more profitable as a company. And I have a link in the uh, comments to a video that goes into more detail about the importance of this kind of psychological efficiency. Another big uh, aspect of the research in uh, industrial organizational psychology is on leadership, like what makes a good leader. And we've identified two basic leadership styles. You can call these Theory X and Theory Y. So Theory X, that style of leadership, uh, sometimes we call it scientific management. This is an approach to leadership which really emphasizes worker efficiency. And the basic assumption here is that uh, the employees don't want to work. You, they have to be motivated to work. They have to be compelled to work. They don't want to take the responsibility. They don't want to show an initiative. So it's kind of like the boss has to pressure them to do anything right. And that's unfortunately the most common kind of leadership style you see. Most of us have had jobs, many, many jobs, where that leadership style is clearly at play. But the research has definitely shown that for many jobs, theory why leadership is far superior. And this is an approach to leadership which is in many ways the opposite. You know, now we're focusing on the human relations. We're focusing on that psychological efficiency I was just talking about. And it views people from a much more responsible, industrious uh, light. You know, people, the employees are interested in being challenged and showing that they can perform. So the basic assumption of this theory why is that the employees do want to work. They do want to do a good job. They want to have job satisfaction. They want to feel like what they're doing matters. And they are, you know, needing of that kind of responsibility. They don't need to be coerced. They just need to be allowed to grow. Other kinds of leadership strategies that have been identified would be things like shared leadership or participative management, you could call it, where all employees are involved in the decision-making process. You, know, you most often will still have a boss, but that boss is not considered to be like an autocrat or anything like that. It's, it's much more democratic. 
And then you have management by objectives where the workers are given uh, specific goals that they need to meet and like a timeline of when to meet them. And they don't really need to go back to that boss again anytime soon because they can see exactly how well they're progressing and they know when they need to work harder or when they can take a break. Uh, another strategy would be self-managed teams where you have groups of employees that work together on specific goals. So it's kind of like you, you segment out your uh, employees to accomplish different very specific tasks. And then you have quality circles which are voluntary like employee discussion groups that look at ways that they can improve quality of the work, uh, quality of the workplace, the overall atmosphere and try to find ways to solve various kinds of problems that might arise. Another really interesting aspect of the research in IELTS psychology is on women as business leaders. Now, what we've generally seen is that female leaders are becoming much more prevalent in our society, not just business leaders, but political leaders as well. How, unfortunately though, there are still some very clear gender-based stereotypes that make it more difficult for women to be leaders than men. It makes them harder to reach that level of, you know, business status, but it, it also makes it harder for them to function at that level. If, if you want to review what I was talking, what I'm talking about when it comes to these gender-based stereotypes, in one of the previous videos I talk in great d detail about, you know, human sexuality. So you should definitely check that out. But what I basically said in that video was that women are expected to be more passive. Women are expected to be more emotion-focused. They're not expected to be goal-oriented necessarily. And this obviously contrasts with what we expect of leaders. We expect leaders to be goal-oriented. We expect leaders to be what's called agentic, you know, independent, uh, confident, ambitious objective, dominant, and forceful. And as you can clearly see, this clashes significantly with what we expect of women. So what we often see is when women are not showing these signs, the employees don't respect them because they're not being a good leader. But when, when women do show these lines, they're not respected because they're not acting feminine enough. So it's like, in many cases, female leaders, they, they, they can't win. No matter what they do, they're going to be criticized and they're going to be rejected by people who hold on to these stereotypes. I, if you've ever heard somebody call a young girl bossy because she's being dominant, that's exactly what that is. That's, that's sexism. That's people saying that women should not be forceful. Women should not be dominant. And that term bossy, in my opinion, should never be applied to a young girl or a woman because it's just clearly a sexist term. Another big aspect of industrial organizational research is on job satisfaction. So these are those things that make an employee uh, comfortable and satisfied with their work. The basic rule here is that it's, there's no universals, there's no objective measurements of job satisfaction because job satisfaction comes from a good fit between the employee and their interests, like the employee's interests, abilities, needs, and expectations, and the requirements of the job. So you basically, you just need to fit the right person in the right position and they will have a high level of job satisfaction as a result. But there's a few other things that you can do to just make the employees more satisfied in general. Like in, in general, one thing that increases job satisfaction is flexible work schedules. So uh, there's a few different ways you can do this. You can do something called flex time, where you have flexible working hours. That just means you don't need to clock in and clock out at specific points of the day. Uh, you just need to work for a certain number of hours each day or work for a certain number of hours each week or something like this. But when you show up and how long you stay, it's up to you. Uh, something else that's being talked about and employed in greater amounts uh, around the world is compressed work weeks. So with this, the, the employees might only work like 
three three days a week, but during those three days, they're you know really going at it really hard. So they they're spending a lot more time in those three days working because they get you know more time off. And then there's telecommuting, which I'm personally a big fan of. I mean, obviously we're telecommuting right now because I'm giving this presentation over the internet. But telecommuting is a great way to increase job satisfaction because, as you can imagine, it's quite nice to be able to work from home. You can basically just roll out of bed, sit down at the computer, and get to work. You don't have to commute. You don't have to deal with all those hassles. And if you have children, like I do, it's much easier to take care of them if you don't have to leave the house. Something similar to job satisfaction is job enrichment. So job enrichment refers to deliberate attempts made by the employer to increase the job satisfaction for their employees, to increase their employees' overall, you know, appreciation for that job. So these, these employers are trying to make the job more personally rewarding, interesting, or motivating, intrinsically motivating. So they're just trying to increase their work, workers' overall empowerment and knowledge. And this can be done in many different ways. Uh, at many of the jobs I've had, they've offered what are called like, you know, basically they're like job enrichment courses where you can sign up for various courses. Like they, they expect you to take a certain number of courses per semester. And you sign up for a certain number of courses. Some of these are more fun. Some of these are more serious. But no matter which ones you sign up for, you're going to learn. You're going to learn how to be a better instructor. You're going to learn how to be a better uh, academic. Or maybe you're just going to learn about something really interesting, like the underlying theories behind certain movies or something like that. So like I said, these can be either just like for fun or they can be directly applicable to the work that you're performing. In fact, I took courses on how to make YouTube videos and how to do teaching online before I you know, started doing this so that I would have some knowledge as to what I want to do and how I'm going to do it. I would not be making these videos right now if it wasn't for those courses that I took. As I mentioned, with industrial organizational psychology, we have that industrial part which focuses on the specific workers, and then we have the organizational part which is much more broad. So one major aspect of that in organizational part is the company's culture, the organizational culture. You know, those customs, beliefs, values, and attitudes, and rituals that you find in organizations. Each, each company you work for, each organization you work for, is going to have its own kind of social norms that you have to learn. Own, like, you know, ways of navigating this organizational environment. And what we tend to see is that employees that fit well in an organization will show what's called organizational citizenship. And that just means they will proactively, voluntarily make positive contributions to the success of the company that generally goes well beyond their own job description. A specific kind of industrial organizational psychology would be personnel psychology, which focuses on the testing, selection, and placement of uh, employees in the company. So typically what's done during this process is called a job analysis, where the personnel psychologists they will look at the various jobs and really try to break them down based upon what skills, knowledge, and activities are required to perform this job well, and then they'll try to you know, find employees that match those you know, descriptions. Oftentimes when they're trying to find those employees, they will, first of all, they'll look at your bio data. That would be like your application, you know, resume, whatever. They're just looking at detailed biographical information about you, like the places you've worked, uh, the people you know, that kind of stuff. But they'll almost always also conduct a personal interview. And I've talked before about the problems with interviews. There's so many sources for bias but a well-trained personnel psychologist will be able to avoid most of those kinds of bias, thankfully. 
Now something that's often employed during this kind of selection of new employees and promotion of current employees involve, you know, like standardized tests. Uh, like uh, you could do like a questionnaire, you could do a situational test, but it's always about just trying to assess to see if this, you know, employee could perform at a higher level. So for example, in high school, you probably completed something called a vocational interest test. So this is typically pencil and paper, and this is just to help you have a general direction of like what kinds of careers might be good for you. And then you might have also taken an aptitude test, and that just is a, a kind of test that allows you to uh, allows people to see like how fit are you for certain kinds of positions. Now, when you do go work for some companies, sometimes they'll have this testing like at the site. Like you, you go and you apply and then they take you to a room and you sit down and you fill out a questionnaire. So a lot of major companies have assessment centers for new uh, potential employees. And as I just mentioned, sometimes this kind of process will involve a situational judgment test. So that's where you're put into like a real realistic um, situation in the workplace to just see how you will react, see how we, you would perform if you were actually employed to have that job. Most companies do this to a certain extent. Like this is why we have internships. The whole point of an internship is to put you into a realistic work situation to see how good of a job you can do.